you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to the book of Jonah, chapter 3, Jonah, uh, chapter 3 this morning, and uh, we're going to be looking at the entirety of Jonah, chapter 3, in just uh, a moment. You know, um, I would imagine every one of us has had uh, seasons of regret or individual times of regret in his or her life, and uh, that's true for me. Uh, one such regret happened um, it was about 18 years ago. It was back in 2006. I was on a mission trip uh, to off the southeast coast of Africa, and in our travels, we had about a full day layover in Paris, France. And so as I was there, I was able to see the Eiffel Tower, and I stood beneath it. And uh, I looked up and said, I think I'll go up on that thing to say I'd done it. Then I looked at the line and decided, well, I'm not going to do it. And believe it or not, I regret not doing that. It's something that was right there. I'll probably never be there again. And I didn't take that opportunity. And so when the church was so good to give us a trip to Italy and Karen was there, I'd been to Italy before, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon. We had traveled for a long time. Uh, all the rest of our party, because our sisters, their husbands, they actually joined us on the trip, and everyone was tired. We were right on the edge of the city of Rome, getting ready to go in the hotel, and I went to my brother-in-law, and I said, we've got to go to the Spanish Steps and the Trevi Fountain, and we did it, and I'm glad that we did it. But you know, there are times that we have regrets in our lives, things that we do not take the opportunity to do. And there, there are times we have spiritual regrets, that we have had opportunities to serve God or to do something for God, or in the case we'll see today, to witness for God, and we miss that opportunity. Uh, I've had a number of those, I'm ashamed to say, even as a minister, where I have missed opportunities and realized after the fact. But one that really sticks out at me uh, years ago, and Bob, this was when I worked at Greenfront, actually. Uh, one summer as a student, I was working uh, for Greenfront Furniture. I was delivering furniture, and all summer we would head out all over the state. I didn't have to go out of state and deliver furniture. And I was riding with a co-worker, I believe his name was Richard. This has been 30-some years ago. And as we were riding, he was driving. Uh, we looked on a hill, and as you would see here at Smyrna, and you see in various places, there were three crosses. And uh, this guy didn't know the Lord, and he said, what does that represent? And I said, well, that just represents where Christ died. And I allowed the subject matter to change very quickly. This was a season in my life when God was working in a powerful way. I'd reaffirmed the Lordship of Christ. I was committed to, to being involved in Bible study. I was committed uh, to the point of being willing to go to seminary. And this guy basically sets the table for me to witness to him. And I take about three seconds to say something and allow the subject matter to be changed. It can happen. Uh, it happened to Peter. Uh, as we heard in uh, the song earlier with Peter having denied uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He had opportunity three times to identify with Christ and each time he denied him. It happened to the apostle Peter as Paul writes in Galatians. Paul had to address Peter and even Barnabas who was an encourager and godly man got caught up in this, they were around Gentiles, and then when the Jews came into the room, they began to separate themselves from them, being uh, ashamed of the fact that uh, they were hanging with these individuals, and so Paul had to rebuke both of them in the letter because they were acting in a way that was inconsistent with the gospel. And so today, we see another biblical illustration of someone who missed an initial chance. God had called Jonah uh, to go and to witness to the city of Nineveh. And instead of heading in the direction of Nineveh, he headed in the opposite way. And so last week we saw what ha happened uh, in the reluctant hands of 
those who were traveling with him. He was cast into the water. Uh, the waters became still for them, but things began to be troubling for Jonah. God sent a fish, a great fish who swallowed him. And Jonah now is at a point after facing the turbulent waters and the cavernous cavity of that fish's stomach. He's ready to do what God had called him to do. And listen, by the grace of God, he had a second chance. Look with me at, jo at Jonah chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed in 40 days Nineveh will be demolished. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh by order of the king and his nobles. No person or animal, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and his wrongdoing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. God saw their actions that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with and he did not do it. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word again in and, and this Old Testament prophet, um, we thank you, God, that you have a plan, and you have a plan, Lord, to get the truth of the gospel, to get your message to people. And Lord, as we'll see today, it involves bringing together lots of things and a uh, number of things and how you orchestrate it. And Lord, part of that instrument, part of that ingredient, Lord, is us, that God, you still use individuals to communicate your truth. And so, Lord, speak in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Things are really picking up in June, in Jonah, rather, as we move to chapter 3. In the first two chapters, we see this struggle uh, of God trying to get this reluctant prophet Jonah where God desires him to be. And so here in Jonah chapter 3, we see that God reaches his desired end. He gets the attention of the prophet. Jonah preached. The people heard, the leaders heard, they repented, and God relented from sending that judgment. We're going to see next week that Jonah's heart still was not right, yet God was working. And, and, and as someone I was talking with uh, who was part of uh, the group that is doing the crusade, they were dropping materials off this week, and we were talking about Jonah. And he said, God did it in spite of Jonah. People were being saved. And we both agreed with that, but we also acknowledged that Jonah missed a blessing. And we miss a blessing where we're not willingly uh, being witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. So today as we study chapter 3, I want to note that there are four components that are at work as Jonah is navigating his way into the city of Nineveh. The first day he went and he proclaimed and said it was a, a three-day journey elsewhere. And here we've seen the city of Nineveh was called great, not in a moral sense, but great in a vast sense, great in significance. And so we see that this reluctant prophet actually obeys what God called him to do. And we see a miraculous deliverance of a wicked people. And what is true for Jonah is also true today. In fact, the four ingredient, ingredients, the, these four uh, components that are involved in a witnessing encounter were true in the Old Testament. They're true as we're going to see in the New Testament, and they're true even today. And so I want to look at each of these four, and the first is this. God is the central focus. God is the central figure in this work that we see. You know, there are a number of memorable messages that I've heard over the years, and there are a lot that I've forgotten. There are a lot I say I, I may have preached that I've forgotten. 
Uh, I appreciate Alvin said one time, uh, you know, preachers preach messages, and uh, the next week people will forget them. But he said, Rick, be encouraged. We forgot what we ate yesterday, but we still were nourished by it. And so we find nourishment anytime we go into God's Word. But there are times when we have memorable messages. And one of them uh, was given by Dr. Tommy Lee, who was one of my uh, mentors, who was professor of New Testament, later dean of School of Theology at uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, where I attended. And uh, it was very interesting that the message I heard was not in a classroom setting, but after he had retired, he found out that he had prostate cancer that was not di uh, diagnosed very early, had moved to bone cancer, and he preached this message about three to six months before he passed, actually at my home church in Appomattox. And he was preaching about the parables of the great pearl in the hidden treasure. And he gave an interpretation that was unique I'd never heard. Because whenever I heard about the great treasure that was found, it was dug up, it was found, and the person sold all he had and, and purchased it or, or found the great pearl and sold, I always thought that that represented an individual who found the gospel and gave up all to follow Jesus Christ. And while that is very true, we should give up all. Dr. Lee gave an interesting interpretation. It was very sound biblically. He said, the seeker is God. The seeker is God. That God finds us as a great pressure, pre treasure, rather, and he gives up his greatest possession, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he took us to Romans chapter 3. In verse 11, and he said, there is no one who seeks God. He said, God is the one who is seeking. God is the one who's taking the initial work in it. And that is the case here in Jonah chapter 3. God is the seeker. He is the one who is finding the people. You know, a lot of times we say we hope people find God. And it's like a, this uh, uh, human-centric idea that people will just decide one day I'm going to do this. No, God is the one who takes the initiative. The people of Nineveh, they were just living their lives. And they were living a very hedonistic, a very evil lifestyle. But it was God who was pursuing them. God did not let Jonah alone. And Jonah was a great distance from from Nineveh, yet God continued to work and to mold Jonah to bring him to the people of Nineveh. Why is that? Because people matter to God. Let's not miss the truth in this entire tiny book that while it's a message about Jonah and while it's a message about Nineveh, it is primarily a message about the God who we love and we serve who is seeking people. And there are people in our circles who matter to God. They may be individuals who cut our hair, who wait on us when we go to the store or when we are at school or at work. These people matter to God and many times he places us in situations where we can witness to them. They may be people like my co-worker years ago who had some questions or maybe people who are just living their lives. But I want you to know today on the authority of God's word, God is the one who initiates. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but he's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And God was patient, not just with unbelieving Nineveh. He was patient with Jonah because his sights were on Nineveh. And when we share Christ with people who don't know him, we know that God is our partner in it. When we're led by the Spirit of God and we're witnessing, there's no pressure in it because we have our Lord God Almighty who's joining us in the work. And so the first ingredient in this witnessing encounter in the essential is God. It's by the grace of God that you and I are saved. It's by the grace of God that people are saved. But I want you to see a second instrument. And that's Jonah. Jonah was the God-chosen instrument to share with Nineveh. Now, God, again, gives Jonah an opportunity. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And so he was given another opportunity. And God said in verse 2, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh. Again, not morally great, but vast and preach the message 
that I tell you. Jonah was to be the messenger. You know, those who live on my mail route, if you live in the Shepherd's area or along Highway 15, uh, Crump Town, we have a wonderful mail lady. Her name is Saloma. She does a great job. I was at Catherine's uh, uh, a while back, and she's the type, she'll bring it into the house if people are limited in their mobility. I love Saloma. I try to remember uh, my mail person on birthdays and Christmases, and, uh, and I think that's important. But Saloma does a great job, but guess what? Her job is a limited job. Her job is to get the mail in the mailbox, or if it's too big, thanks to Amazon and all of these things that are using the United States Postal Service now, her job would be to bring it to the porch. It's not her job when she delivers the mail to sit there and say, okay, Rick, open every letter. Let me see you open it. She would never get through her route in a day. It's not her job to pick out our mail and say, well, I don't think this person should get this letter. Maybe that person should get the letter. Her job is merely to deliver the message. That's what Jonah was. Jonah was called to be a messenger. He was not responsible for whether that message would be received or not. He was responsible to be sure the message arrived and listen. He was not the one to determine who is to get which message. God called the city of Nineveh. And, and Jonah we see in next week, one of the more poignant chapters in all of the Bible, we're going to see what is one of the saddest and both most rejoicing accounts all in one. Rejoicing and that the people repent and believe, but sad and that the messenger was not happy in it. I don't know any preacher who would not want to be successful uh, in preaching. But here was a man, his ministry accomplished what God intended. And we'll see next week that he was miserable. Why was that? Because he thought it was his job to decide who should get which mail. He's a deliverer. Romans 10, 15 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. It is a blessing to join God in his work of drawing people to him. And we don't have the pressure of trying to convince people. We don't have the pressure of trying to determine. We just need to listen to him and do what he has called us to do. In just two weeks from tonight, the Go Tell Crusade is coming to our area. And it's exciting. It is something that has not happened in the Farmville area in the time I've been ministry here. That's over 30 years and it demands our allegiance. It demands our commitment because the gospel is going to be preached for the sake of individuals coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's going to be in the spirit and in the way of a Billy Graham crusade. There are people who are spending time. I had the opportunity yesterday. It took me about 35 or 40 minutes, and we're going to have some pamphlets for you afterward. And I was delivering to people, and I had two people tell me this. I have seen this, and I have no idea what it was about. Thank you for bringing this, because I will read it and know what it's about. There are people that are seeing the signs, and they're everywhere. They're even on tractor trailers up in Dillwyn. They're on billboards. There are signs, and people are wondering. And when we take it to them, they say, thank you. You realize 14 of them in about 30 minutes. I wonder if you had an hour for God this week. Is everything you're doing, everything you're doing, do you have an hour for God this week? I hope you do. We have an hour to do everything else. We eat every day. We, we, we do all of our activities uh, and think nothing of it. But when it comes to an hour for God, I don't have an hour for God. After the service today on the front porch, there's some packets that we'll give out for you to distribute. All right, over five hours was spent this week putting together, organizing them, getting them. All you have to do is take them. Take two packs, take 10, take 20. 
Like I said, 14 for me didn't take very long. If you see somebody at the door, just say, hey, you've probably been wondering what these signs are about. I want you to know if, it, if it's more and you, you, need, and you need to spend more time, do it. But even if it's just 30 seconds, get it in someone's hand. If they're not there, leave it on the doorbell. That ring that you ring and somebody's in another country and they pick up. I had that happen yesterday. I said, look, this is what it's about. You've probably seen the signs. I'm going to leave it here. If we can't do that, how are people going to get saved? If we can't even do that, how will people, how will people be saved? We are in this age God's primary instrument to be witnesses for him, to be witnesses for him. I encourage you when you leave here, Pick those up. It may be at work. You give them to people at work. They're wrapped up in packs of five. They'll explain it. You can open it up, and, and there'll be five in each pack. Hopefully, you'll get 10 or 20 Distribute it that people might hear. And so we see Jonah as the instrument. You and I are to be instruments. But I want you to see a third thing, the message. And the message is an essential ingredient. Because as we see, as I was knocking on doors yesterday, people were saying, I see the sign, I see the initial, but what is it? And they open it up, and there's a gospel tract in there. They open it up, and it's explaining what the message of the gospel is. What did Jonah preach to Nineveh? Well, we don't see a whole lot of it. It was very simple. He said, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Now, that got Nineveh's attention. And the thrust of the message is this, God is real and he's displeased with you. And the people there realize that maybe there's a chance that God would relent. In fact, the king says that much in verse 9. Even though the message was in 40 days you'll be demolished, they understood the spirit of that message is you need to get your house in order before then. The king repented and he gave the people the warning and the people fasted and they dressed in sackcloth signs of grief even the animals that they were dependent upon were, were deprived of food because of the grief that they were experiencing and so as we think about going and sharing the good news the truth of the matter is this the good news must be preceded by the bad news and the bad news is this, that we are sinners, that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And no matter how good we may think we are, we're sinners by nature and by choice. God does not work on a system of weights and balances. We think that in the end, if I'm better than my neighbor and I weigh righteously more than my neighbor, or we think in our own lives, if I have been better than I've been worse, then God must let me in. Let me ask you, why would God have sent Jesus to die if you could get there? That's the message of the gospel is Jesus Christ coming and dying, but it's preceded by the fact that we're sinners. Jesus said only the sick need a doctor. What he meant by that is only the person, the individual who realizes that he or she is a sinner, only that person can receive the healing that Jesus Christ brings. And so the message of the gospel calls man to repent to adjust his ways and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says of the gospel that it is a stumbling block or an offense to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who would believe it is the message of salvation. And God takes that message as he did with Jonah, that simple message, and he sealed it in the hearts of the hearers, and they believe. There are people today who need to hear because they're sinners, yet they're loved by God. Romans 10, 14 says, How can they call on him whom they've not believed, and how that can they believe without someone sharing with him? That sharing is the message. Look, a person's not going to be saved by your changed life. They're going to be saved when they look at your changed life and they hear the message of the gospel. It's the message that saves. But I want you to see the fourth ingredient. The recipients. The recipients here were the people of Nineveh, a people with a plea, yet no merit. In other words, we see the desire of God's heart. Now the prophet 
has reached the city. He's gone into the city and he has preached. And, he, and the people of Nineveh were saved. But euphemistically, these people were no choir boys. In fact, they were wicked. They were a wicked, wicked people. In fact, I appreciate when Daniel did his study a couple of months ago, maybe you remember the pictures, the hieroglyphics of the terrible things that they did and gloated over. They they were a wicked people, impaling people. In fact, one of the nice things they would do is if they conquered someone, they would take them into the desert, bury them up to their neck on the hottest of hot days, stick a stake through both cheeks and leave them there with their tongues hanging out to die slowly. And that was just one of the pleasant things that they did. That was their amusement. Yet God cared about them. Jonah thought these people were beyond the mercy of God, and God thought differently. Let me use an a fortiori argument, greater to the lesser. If God cared this much about a wicked person, how much do you think he cares about the person who cuts your hair who doesn't know the Lord, who serves you in the grocery store who doesn't know the Lord? God cares. And there are people who need to hear. Well, the people heard, and the king heard. The scripture says first that the people heard, and they repented. And and it says that the king heard, and and he repented. And they dressed in sackcloth and ashes. They were grieving over their sin. They realized that they had done wrong. They were awakened by the truth of the message of God. It said in verse 5, the people believed God from the greatest to the least. The king believed and called a fast. Even the herd of the flock, he donned sackcloth and ashes. And miraculously, these people who had no knowledge of God before Jonah came, all of a sudden they were transformed by the power of God. And that's the power of the message that is proclaimed. Now we don't know how people will respond when we share the good news of Christ. I was laughing. I gave John some packets. I shared this in Sunday school. John Parker, he had 10 to give out in his uh, area. He said he showed up yesterday. He had one on his door. (laughs) Somebody was doing their work. But you know, I thought, so what if people get it twice? Have you ever thought, you hear something once, if you hear it twice, this, this must be something. So I I thought at first, we need to organize how we're going to do it. We need to take this road and that road. And then I thought, maybe some people need it twice. Maybe they need it to come on Saturday and need it to come on Wednesday. It's not our job to determine who is to hear. We're the male men. We're the male ladies. And so we see these four agents that are playing out. God, who's the initiator, who had a plan. Uh, an instrument, Jonah, that God had called his chosen instrument to share, the message that was pertinent for someone or some ones to be saved, and then the recipients of that. And it plays out every day. It plays out every day. Think in the New Testament. We talked about Peter and Cornelius last week in Acts chapter 10. It was God who initiated. Peter went up on the roof, and God sent him the vision. But not only was he initiating with Peter, he was initiating with Cornelius, telling Cornelius to go and to send people to Peter. God was already working before Peter and Cornelius knew what was happening. What about Peter? He was the believer. When the contingent came from Cornelius, he obeyed God and he went with them and shared. So there was the messenger. And then there was the message. It says that, that Peter preached the good news, the gospel of peace in Christ Jesus. And then there was Cornelius, who, like the Ninevites, was waiting to hear. And he heard and believed. So where do we fit in this? Well, first, we're not God. That's very simple. We're not the ones who to pick and choose. That's what Jonah was trying to do. God will be God. He's going to do what he does. We have the message, but we're not the message. The message is the specific message of the gospel. It's available to every one of us. If we're in Christ, we're not the recipients. We are what? We're the messengers. 
And may it be that we would have a heart that would be different from Jonah. You say, well, I don't know what to do. How can I be a mess- messenger? We talked last week three things. Work on a personal testimony. John Parker was willing on October 30th. I'm, I'm going to be gone that Wednesday night. We're going through Wednesday night in Hosea. But we're going to promote that Wednesday night. He's going to share a testimony, how you can share uh, a testimony. And, and he's willing to lead that. And so it's important to be equipped. And so I encourage you in October, toward the end of October, to do that. We talked about another way we can be a messenger is inviting Inviting people to come to church. Inviting individuals to come to the crusade. September 29th through October 2nd. One way you can invite is right on the front porch. Getting two, three, four packs and say, I'm going to give them to my neighbors. I'm going to give them to people I see at work. And you know what? I did not have one person reject the packet. 14 for 14. 14 for 14. Nobody said, I don't want it. Everybody was curious because they're seeing this stuff. And they're wondering what it, what it is. 14 for 14. And so we go and we invite people to attend. And then finally, praying, God, help me learn a simple way to share my faith. It may be the three circles, which we're going to be doing training. It may be the Roman road. It may be that you go to a solid biblical website. And if you have any question about it, feel free to talk to me or anyone else here in leadership. Is this solid way to share the gospel in doing it? Four, four things that come together. Four things. We're the messengers. We're the male people. We need to do our job. Let's pray. Father, as we go into this week, I pray you would bless these packets that we deliver. It may be a seed that is initial seed. It may be a seed that has already been planted and that this would be what would put it over the top with someone to believe in you. Father, we pray for this uh, upcoming crusade for the evangelist for the workers we pray that people would come out lord there were times in the bible when people came out for curiosity's sake and lord you worked i pray you would use whatever means and especially use us as messengers to draw people to you father we thank you for the privilege of taking this hour this week dedicated to getting your word out because, Lord, if we're saved, it's by the grace of God. Lord, we have no merit before you. We're your servants. And, Lord, it's only right that the servants serve you. And so, Lord, take this ministry and bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how God has spoken to you today, but we want to give you an opportunity in just a moment to respond to his word. Maybe you've never trusted Christ. You've never uh, publicly...